beautiful just on its own like that. Hi everyone! Today I am going to be listening to another band I've never heard before with an interesting name, Alice in Chains. Is that maybe a play on the word on the phrase Alice in Wonderland? I I don't know. Just what comes to mind? Alice in Wonderland? Alice in Chains? Alice in Chains sounds more like a rock metal twist on the whole idea. Anyway, um, before I dive in, let me remind you of Coffee and Patreon, and you can always check out, check out those memberships if you want early access to videos, if you want exclusive access to videos that I can't put publicly here um, because of copyright issues with the YouTube system and all. But let's go on and see what this Alice in Chains is all about. Um, it is an American rock band from Seattle, Washington, formed in 1987. Often associated with grunge music, Alice in Chains sound incorporates heavy metal elements. Oh, I guessed right! Okay! Alice in Chains rose to international fame as part of the grunge movement of the early 90s, along with other Seattle bands such as Nirvana, whom I have heard, Pearl Jam, I don't know if I've heard Pearl Jam yet, I don't think so, and Soundgarden, I just got finished with a whole Chris Cornell weekend and he was part of Soundgarden. Soundgarden. Alice in Chains has had 18 top 10 songs on Billboard's mainstream rock tracks chart, 5 number 1 hits, and received 11 Grammy Award nominations. They were ranked number 34 on VH1's 100 Greatest Artists of Hard Rock and as the 15th greatest live band by Hit Parader. I remember several of you mentioned to me, I've, I've read in some of the comments, this name of the band Alice in Chains, so I guess some of you will be pleased that I finally arrived here. Wood is part of the Singles Film soundtrack. Never watched that film. Its video received an award for best video from a film at the 1993 MTV Video Music Awards. The song was dedicated to Andrew Wood, an American musician who died in 1990 at the age of 24 after being found in a comatose state by his girlfriend following a heroin overdose. In the liner notes of Alice in Chains' Music Bank box set collection, Jerry Cantrell said of the song, I was thinking a lot about Andrew Wood at the time. We always had a great time when we did hang out, much like Chris Cornell and I do. There was never really a serious moment or conversation. It was all fun. Andy was a hilarious guy, full of life, and it was really sad to lose him. But I always hate people who judge the decisions others make. So it was also directed towards people who pass judgments. Andrew Wood is the same artist who was honored by his friends in Pearl Jam and Chris Cornell with the project Temple of the Dog in 1991. I guess I just read about that a bit with my Chris Cornell weekend, so it seems that Andrew Wood must have, must have been a very popular, promising young musician to have so many people commemorate him and, and wish to dedicate musical compositions to him. introduction because it starts first with the bass and then the thing that answers the bass are the drums because if you listen to the opening rhythm here and the guitar comes in and there's some little little touches on the drum set but if you listen to the bass rhythm, yeah da 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 dum dum da da dum bum bum da dum ba da dum ba da dum. Now listen to what comes next. Yeah. 
the drums are kind of echoing that bass entrance. And it's kind of a cool call and response setup because oftentimes we hear that with the voice and with the guitar in the upper register of the band. But here we're hearing it in the deeper register, the bass and then the drums underneath. And, and that is where this conversation within the music is developing first or being presented first in this introduction. It's down at the lower end of the instrumental mix. Kind of nice. stopping it already again. But when the voice entered, it had this very monastic sound. If you listen to uh, plain chant and some of those medieval and renaissance era musical styles where it's all unison, perhaps a fourth or a fifth underneath, and and you can imagine in some great stone building a group of voices just singing these simple clean lines very meditatively this is what it sounded like in the first couple of lines know me broken by my master when he comes in with that listen to how that sounds and see if you can Take away the instruments around it and place it in some ancient stone monastery. Imagine that. And then it goes a little bit more crazy. Timeless quality to it.
nice. So you have this bump da 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 bump da 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 bump da 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 bump da 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 rhythm, and then suddenly, as we're coming towards the end, the the drums give us a, a little bit of a more of a triplet stretched out moment, as if it's preparing us for the putting on of the brakes. You can hear it coming there. Listen. Even though the speed isn't diminishing at all. Interesting. Interesting ending too. Because those triplets signaled to us that the end was coming. And then it goes a bit more, a bit more, and then suddenly kind of like some big Beethoven symphony ending. Bomb, 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 bomb. The end. This very emphatic, assertive, um, final sound, simply by augmenting the, the tempo, not the tempo, the rhythm. Augmenting the rhythm to the point where instead of having multiple syllables or multiple um, notes within a beat, suddenly there's a single syllable, single note on each of the big beats at the end. And then suddenly that's it. That's all we need. It's just so final and emphatic. Well, kind of an interesting link there because his death was so early as well and this entire piece of music had this very energetic um, moving forward just a lot of activity a sense of a lot of activity and and busyness going on not harmonically but texturally um, rhythmically the rapid pace of the drums and and everything, all the instruments were keeping it lively, flurried. And then suddenly we have this signal that the end is coming. Dum, bum, 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 bum. And then bum, 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 bum. Rather like an energetic, happy, um, talented life suddenly coming to a final end a bit sooner than expected, a bit sooner than it should have been. I don't know if that's what he intended, but the music suits the intent of commemorating and honoring this friend and this musician. Well, I want to look a little bit at what is it that makes this melody give that sort of plain chant quality at times. So let's go back in the score a little bit and, and look a little bit closer at what is this melody made up of. So first of all, one of the qualities that we find in a lot of that we could call it ancient music, is a, a type of tonality that places home in a different relationship to other notes than a lot of the modern major and minor, um, traditional major and minor tonality. What do I mean by that? Well, let's just take do a deer, a female deer, and we have do re mi fa so la si do. And so we have a certain relationship between each of those steps of the scale. 
do, re, mi, fa, so, and we hear it even if you don't know all the technical relationships behind it, you hear it. And we, we can very clearly hear that do is home and everything else has some connection, some relationship to that note. Well, that entire piece of music, entire little song, is built off of what we call the major scale. And each of those pitches, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, si, do, are one of the notes in a major scale. And those are the notes, the building blocks, which create that entire edifice. Now, if we go to, well, I know it's very common in, in a lot of this modern rock music as well, but it also goes way back to ancient times. We have what are called modes. Now, what's the difference between a mode and a scale? Well, practically speaking, you could even call them the same thing. The only difference is that modes, we could say there are a lot more different modes than there are major and minor scales. And so, in fact, you can even call the major and minor scale by modal identification, ident identifying names. So, this mode, well, when this melody comes in, it sounds a bit like this. That certainly doesn't sound like do. Doesn't sound like do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do. It, it, it simply doesn't match there, right? It's a different sound, a different set of relationships, and it creates a different atmosphere. Really beautiful. This one happens to be what we call the Dorian mode. Well, also these first five notes are the first five notes of a minor scale. So we can name it different ways, but I'm going to call it the Dorian mode simply because it has that sound quality about it. In fact, there's a little piece of piano music which I teach my very elementary students. And it's built around the Dorian mode. And it's all done in unison. And the idea is to evoke this, this medieval, plain chant, um, modal sound world. We could do that with this and just play it in octaves. Maybe let's do two octaves apart. We'll slow it down a bit. Just to enjoy the resonance of it. Let's take it up a couple of octaves. It's so beautiful, just on its own like that. I could even spread it apart. What if I go way in the bass and up here? Let's hope these notes are in tune up here. They've been kind of tricky the past few days. Simply by moving it one octave here, one octave there, spreading it further apart, placing it closer together, we get all these wonderful, subtle, exquisitely beautiful shades and colors. And I like doing it on the heart because it has this sort of resonance which, which creates this feeling kind of like if you were in a very large acoustic space that gives you this this reverb sound and everything's all the sound swirls together and you don't really need a lot of harmonizing behind it because it's so beautiful on its own well there actually is a touch of harmony in this melody in, in this verse here and it is harmonized at the fifth which I mentioned in passing just very briefly a little bit ago that a lot of this old music harmonized 
by fourths and fifths. What do I mean by that? I simply mean that the harmonizing note is either the fifth note above or the fourth note above. If I were to harmonize this with fifths, we would get this sound. It's a very open, resonant, um, you could almost call it a hollow sound. Well, in fact, what do you know as power chords on the guitar are exactly these two things. The octave, which I just showed you the melody some octaves apart, and the fifth inserted between. So I, if I play this note, one, two, three, four, five, here's the fifth. Here's another fifth. to this melody as it is sung. You hear what I've been playing and you hear towards the end of the phrase just a touch of this fifth harmonization. It sounds a bit like this. And that fifth added there at the end simply enhances and expands and builds out this, this quality of, well, I think when I first said, I, I said it sounds a bit monastic. Why did I say that? Because, because so much of this kind of music was sung and created in the um, Western European religious tradition of monasteries and cathedrals and, and that was where Western classical music was nurtured and grew for so many centuries. This gives that quality. I love it. What if I just take the harmony up one octave just for fun? A different sound. You might play around with it yourself. Well, I should tell you what I'm starting on if you want to play around on your own instrument. This is pitched in such a key that I had to move a bunch of pedals on the harp. I have everything sharp. So I'm starting on D sharp. I'm starting on E sharp, rather. Going to A sharp, G sharp, F sharp, back to E sharp, down to D sharp back to E sharp and D sharp. You could play it in flats as well, in which case you would be starting on E flat. That would, that would work as well. But anyway, interesting tonality, interesting choice of melody in this music, and to place it in this rather hard rock context is still novel to my ears, although I've been on this journey for over a year now, and I have certainly heard these modal qualities within the rock music quite frequently. However, this particular one, the way he sang it with his straight, gentle voice, very cleanly, again sent me back to many of the, to kind of the origins or, or the older form of this type of music. And this was a fun little trip down that road and I hope you enjoyed it. And I guess the other thing I wanted to comment on was lyrically, um, I can easily see in the lyrics, both his, his reflections on the death of this musician, as well as his discomfort and his his very strong re feeling of repulsiveness towards people who judge others' actions. When he says, so I made a big mistake, try to see it once my way. That's coming back over and over in the music. So I made a big mistake, try to see it once my way. Have I run, am I wrong? Have I run too far to get home? Have I gone and left you here alone? He's framing it 
as well, same old trip it was back then. Something that had been done many times. Somehow it messed up. It it was there was a mistake. Something happened. You know, it was a heroin overdose. Too much. By accident. It wasn't intentional. It was not something that was ever meant to be done. And yet this tragic ending. So I can clearly find in the lyrics these sentiments of his as he commemorates and honors this friend. Well, this has been an interesting listen, my first introduction to Alice in Chains. I suppose I'll come back and visit it at some point in the future. But there we have it. Wood. And I'll see you soon.